Give him wisdom, a new wisdom, a new, a new right spirit, Lord. Oh, Lord, just continue to build him into the leader that you, you're making him into, Lord. And he's such a great leader, Lord. I don't need to polish his shoes, but he's doing great, Father God. So we just worship you for him. We just ask you, Lord, just to continue to fill him full of wisdom. And uh, we love you and we worship you. Yes, Lord, thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you for your, thank you for your joy, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Be sure to enter your hours. of the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're glad you're here. Hallelujah. I really, I don't know, I have a lot of expectation for tonight. I think every single one of you, your steps have been ordered by the Lord. And some other ones, their steps were supposed to be ordered of the Lord to be here and they're not. And guess what? They're going to miss out. They're going to miss out. That's okay. It, you know, happens. It happens sometimes not just saying that because I'm preaching either. God is up to something. So let us praise him with everything in us. Let's give him our high praise tonight. Come on. Our high praise is praising just a little bit beyond our comfort zone. Our high praise is praising just a little bit beyond where we're comfortable, where we're happy, Maybe it's going to be a bit of a sacrifice tonight. That's why it's called a sacrifice of praise. Hallelujah. Our high praise is praising through our mood, praising through our tiredness. Come on. I know lots of people had a full week of work. Praising through to get to what he has. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God, you are awesome. God, you are mighty. God, you are great and greatly to be praised. God, 
God, you are in control of every circumstance. Lord Jesus, we want to climb the mountain of the Lord tonight. We want to meet with you face to face. If you don't come with your cloud, we won't come. If you don't come with your fire, we won't stop until you come. Hallelujah. Come with your cloud. Come with your fire. Come tonight, Holy Spirit, come. Come have your way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, tonight you're going to break down a stronghold. A stronghold. Individually. A stronghold. Territorially. There are strongholds coming down. Our shout will tear down the wall tonight. Hallelujah. Praise you, God. You have called this to be the group of people who will pray praise through to see the walls of this city and the walls of this region come down. Lord, I thank you. God, I thank you that you have chosen every single person who's in this house right now. You have made them a part of your plan. You have ordained their steps. There is deliverance for each and every person. Yeah, you might not think you needed some, but you might have needed some. Hallelujah. There is breakthrough for every single person. There is family restoration. Hallelujah. There is fire. Refining fire. Glory fire. Praise you, Jesus. He's lighting you up tonight. Who's ready to be lit up? Yeah. We receive it tonight, Jesus. Let's give him praise. Thank you. 
If you believe it, shout to the Lord. Thank you. 
heard the Spirit of the Lord say, I'm stirring some things up. I'm stirring some things up. I'm stirring up my people. But I heard the Lord saying, don't add anything to the mixture. It's appropriate that we're singing about the fire of God. Because when, you, when you're making something, and you're stirring something, all, and, and you're, you're, you're taking individual things, you're putting them into one, and together to create something new, what do you need is the catalyst. Bakers know this. You need fire. You need heat. Amen? What I heard the Lord saying, that I'm stirring up my people, but not to add anything to the mixture. If you look into the Bible and you look at that word stirred, there's many times where the Bible says God stirred his people in some way, shape, or form. But that word stirred is maybe a little bit different than we typically think of it. It actually means to agitate. To agitate. Now maybe some of you have already felt this stirring. I think there's going to be preaching on this stirring in a little bit. Or touching upon this. There's this holy agitating that God is doing. In the Bible, when God stirs His people, He stirs His people towards compassion. He stirs His people towards wisdom. He stirs His people towards freedom. He stirs His people towards power and gifts. Amen? But what's happened so often in the world today, in the Christian world today, is when we feel that agitation, we want to add our own little pepper to the mix, our own little seasoning to the mix, which is usually, it's their fault. And God is saying, I'm stirring something up so something can be changed and transformed. But don't add your seasoning to the mix, says the Lord. Amen? Jesus was a little stirred up when he turned the tables. But he wasn't adding his own. He was simply doing what the Father showed him. What the Father stirred him to do. What the praises of the people of God stirred him to do. This is a season of stirring. When God stirs, things change. Amen? When God stirs, things are uprooted and transformed. But there's a responsibility on our part to not add our seasoning to the mix. Hallelujah. So if you've been feeling a holy frustration and you don't know why, God is stirring you. But he's stirring you towards his principles, his way, his precepts. Amen. He's not stirring you towards gossip. He's not stirring you towards blame shifting. He's not stirring you towards complaining. He's stirring you towards freedom, towards breakthrough. Hallelujah. Towards his power, towards his provision. So, Father God, I thank you that you're stirring us. And your your fire is heating some things up. Your fire is heating things up. And you're transforming things. And you're galvanizing things in us and around us. And I thank you, Father God, as we stay true to what you're stirring in us, what you're agitating in us, that you're doing a powerful and a mighty transformative work in our families, in our workplaces, in the Brainerd Lakes region, in Minnesota and beyond. We thank you. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. Hallelujah. The Lord gave me a word in Zechariah. I lost my spot. Give me a moment here. Well, I'll go with God, what God said. I heard the Lord say that sometimes we think of fire is a bad thing, but fire is a good thing, says the Lord, because it brings refining, and it makes things that are rougher edge, makes them more refined and perfect and the Lord says I'm doing a work in each of you tonight that there is going to be uh, a fire lit tonight that is going to bring that refining work that is going to perfect the work that's been doing that I've been doing in use of the Lord so that you are prepared for the next level anointing I'm going to put upon you says the Lord hallelujah
We thank you, Father God, for your refining fire here tonight. And that you're just getting started. You're just getting warmed up. Amen. Come on, God's just getting started. We praise and we worship to exalt him. He inhabits and he enthrones our praises. Our praises silence the enemy. Silence the foe and the avenger. Execute written judgment. That means right now, right now, the enemy's got a headache. He may have been bugging you all week. He may have been really giving you a hard time all week. But right now, he's the one with the headache. Amen. The Bible says that Judah, which means praise, Judah plows. It means our praise readies the ground. It readies the soil for the seed. That means right now, the ground of our hearts are prepared to receive what God has for us. That means when the instruments stop and the singing stops, that means that the fire doesn't stop. It's just getting going. Amen. That we are vessels that have now been prepared to receive what God has for us tonight. And God has something for you tonight. Come on, somebody look at somebody. God Say, God has something for you tonight. Amen. God is fully capable. Come on. God is fully capable of bringing a group of people together in one place and having something and speaking something to every single person individually. Amen? You're not the exception. God has something for you. Amen? Hallelujah. So do me a favor. I want you to turn around. I want you to greet two or three people. I want, I want you to say, there's fire in the house tonight. Kids, you can be dismissed to Kids Church. Amen. Hallelujah. How is everyone doing? Come on, you're fiery. <laughs> Hallelujah. If, if, you're fi if you're feeling physical fire, if you're feeling some physical warmth, then you're blessed because it is September 27th, and it is warm outside for September 27th, at least here in Minnesota. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it is a wonderful time of our service. You guys know what time it is. It is... Offering time, time for a Friday evening tithes and offerings. If you need an envelope, they should be in the seat backs in front of you. Uh, checks can be written out to high praise. And, of course, if you're an app person, you can use the app Tidely on your screen there. And if you're watching back online, there's a QR code on your screen that you can scan any time to give. Um, and drop boxes are located on the sides and by the steps. Uh, you can drop your gifts anytime you want. You can do it before service, after service, whenever you need. Um, but um, you know that the Bible says... I'm going to bring you to a new scripture I, have, I, I don't talk about much. But Psalm 16... Verse 11 says this, speaking of God, you will show me the path of life. Well, that sounds good, right? You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Well, that's a pretty good scripture, right? Come on, you're going to show me your presence. There's fullness of joy and there's, there's treasures forevermore. Amen? But it starts with, you will show me the path of life. 
You, God, will show me the path of life. Now, the question is, what's the path of life? path of life is God's precepts, his commandments, his, his principles. Amen? Amen? You know what one of those is? Just one of them? Giving. Giving is one of the things that God has showed us. It talks about in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, all over the place, that, that God is a giving God, that, we, that he loves a cheerful giver and all that. So one of the things that is a part of, a part of he, him showing us the path of life so that in his presence we can have the fullness of joy and so that um, we can, at his right hand, we can receive pre- pleasures forevermore. Let's talk about eternity, but, but he also came so that we could have life abundantly here on earth, right? Then giving is a part of that. Not the only part. I, I get it, I understand that, but giving is a part of that. In other words, you're not going to get fullness of joy if, you're, if you don't have a revelation understanding of giving. You're going to have a partialness of joy. And that doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? Hey, Chris, would you like some partialness of joy? Okay, you'd like the full thing? All right. Full meal deal. Okay, Chris wants a full meal deal. Amen. Supersize it. That's right. Supersize. All right. So, anyways, it's, it, this is just kingdom, right? This is kingdom. This is, this is how God works. Again, not, it's not one principle above the others or, or anything like that. It's all of them working together. But, uh, but giving, as we say so often, is, is the one thing that, that uh, the primary thing that can pull and steal our hearts away from God. Right? It has been that way since the beginning with Cain and Abel. Um, and it can steal our hearts away from God. And so when we can give cheerfully, when we can give hilariously, then our hearts are in tune with God's heart. And then our hearts are in tune with being able to receive the fullness of joy. You ever heard it's better to give than it is to receive? All right. There's, there's joy in it if you, if you understand the principle and you embrace the principle and you know that you can't outgive God. Amen? So take your gifts in your hand, hold up your phones, whatever you need to do, and let's pray over the giving. Father God, I thank you for each gift, and I thank you for each giver, and I thank you for this opportunity to sow into your kingdom. I thank you, Lord, that as we give tonight, your word says it's given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I thank you, Lord, that you rebuke the devourer for our sakes because we are cheerful and hilarious givers. And all God's people said... Amen. All right. A few quick announcements here. Uh, first of all, The Send continues this Thursday at, um, at uh, 7 o'clock. Who here has been blessed by The Send so far? Amen. We are just, we're really getting into the meat of it now. Um, actually, we talked about Thursday. It's technically not the meat. We're getting into the milk of it. But, uh, but if you weren't here, then you just got to watch it back. Anyways, um, but we're getting, in, we're, we're getting into the full swing of the class is a better way of saying it. Um, but uh, Thursday nights here at the church in Brainerd, uh, 7 o'clock sharp, we start. Uh, we also, for St. Cloud folks, um, we are uh, um, Skyping it live to St. Cloud, so, so the folks in St. Cloud can, uh, can watch it live um, at the sanctuary there as well. Um, so make sure that you, uh, you come, you check that out. If you missed any weeks, that's okay. We have uh, the, uh, um, the, the paperwork for the, for the previous weeks that uh, you can grab and get caught up with. And there's, there's videos for the previous weeks as well. Um, if you just connect with us, we'll, we'll make sure that you get those. All right. Um, also, Operation Christmas Child is in full swing. Uh, next week, um, Pastor Hannah is going to give us uh, some more information on that. But you'll see out in the lobby that there is a, a drop box. You can d- drop donations. There's, if you want to, there's really there's three ways that you can participate in Operation Christmas Child. Uh, the first one is you can buy supplies that will fit into a shoebox. There's information there on the kinds of things that, that uh, they need and the kinds of things that don't work. Um, if you want to um, buy some supplies or you see something that, that could work that would fit in a shoebox, then you can do that and drop it in the drop box there. And, and uh, the kids then it, at some point in uh, end of October, beginning of November, will we'll put all those shoeboxes together. That's number one. Number two, uh, you, can, um, you can just give towards that. If you want to give and let the kids figure out what they want to buy, which I think they're doing today, they're kind of coming up with a strategy and a plan for fundraising and, and the sort of things they want to put in these, the boxes. So uh, if you just want to donate towards it, you can donate towards it, and you can mark on your check on Tithely, just say Operation Christmas Child um, or some, something like that. And it'll, it'll go to Pastor Hannah and, and the kids for that. And then finally, if you want to fill a, a shoebox of your own as a family, which some families like to do that as part of their tradition, there's a few in the lobby there. You can grab one of those, and you can just fill it up however you want to do. You can make your own tradition out of it, and you can fill it up and just bring it back here um, before we, we, uh, we pack them up and send them out. So those are the three different ways uh, that you can uh, participate in it. It's awesome. Um, it's an awesome, awesome uh, ministry. And like I said, next week we're going to give you a lot more information on what that looks like and how that works. Amen.
Um, also, just a reminder, Sunday morning refresh here at the church in Brainerd, 11 o'clock. If you don't have a Sunday morning church, um, we highly or, or you know somebody who doesn't, we encourage you uh, to come check it out. It is a 100% high praise church, but it is compressed down to about an hour 10, hour 15 minutes. Um, it's very, I, Sarah and I always really enjoy it. It's, it's very prophetic. Uh, we never really know what we're going to minister, and it's always good um, and, and exciting and fun. I also encourage you, um, I will say this not just for uh, Sunday refresh, but also just for Friday nights and Saturday nights, uh, invite somebody. Invite somebody. Um, now, I know a lot of you guys uh, have, have done that, but uh, when Doug and Karen were here, we were talking to Doug and Karen, actually, and Steve uh, kind of backed this up when it comes to uh, marketing. Same sort of principle applies in marketing as well. But, but um, we were talking about just, you know, people and inviting people and all that sort of stuff, and Doug said that um, statistics say it takes seven times of inviting the same person before they come. Seven times. That was, and, and Steve was like, that's what they say in marketing, that they need to, you need to get the product in front of them or they need to hear about it or see it seven times before um, you, you'll get them as a customer or, or the considerate or, or whatever, right? And so, I mean, that kind of, so it both shocked me and didn't shock me, you know? It's like, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> um, I mean, how, in, in other words, how many times do we invite somebody and we give up if they don't show up the one time we invited them? So the encouragement here is, if you have somebody in mind that you know you think could, could be blessed by being connected with high praise and, and they're, they're coming up with excuses, well, join the club. And Tammy and Steve came up with excuses for six months to a year, didn't you? More than that, yeah, all right? Um, but keep inviting them is my point. Keep inviting them. You know, don't, don't be, you know, uh, annoying and pushy about it, but, but be persistent about it, amen? Um, because, uh, because God's got something for him. I know God says something for him. I know that God has people here that, that uh, this church can be a blessing to, meaning you all can be a blessing to them. Amen? So invite people. Um, and then finally, Prayer Push 2023 um, is in full swing. Um, so again, the four things we were praying for, we we're praying for one another's prophetic destiny. We were praying for um, the, uh, over the election. We we're praying for the prophetic destiny of Minnesota. And we are praying for the draw, a revival and awakening here in, in uh, Brainerd Lakes and in St. Cloud. Amen. Um, and so our goal of 9,999 is our overall goal, and we are currently on milestone number 10. 7,933 is our current milestone. Now, some of you gotten tired of, of trying to find out what that means. Uh, Janice is uh, chuckling. She's like, I give up. I give up. I don't know. I'm so, she's so close. She's so close. All right? Uh, I know that Michael found it right, like right away, and he actually he admits he kind of found it by accident. Um, but how many are pretty sure they figured out the first piece of the, that, what the 7,933 means? All right? All right? You, you guys do. Okay. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start giving you some hints here. All right? It has to, it doesn't ha that number doesn't have to do with a, a um, scripture. It has to do with a Hebrew word. Okay? And then the second hint here for, this is going to get it for you, Janice. But there's only one place in scriptures that exact word is used. It's only one place. Now, there's other words that translate into English to be the same word, but that particular one only shows up in one place. And it is a pertinent sort of thing for the season that we are in. So there you go. There is my big hints with this if you guys want to um, dive in and start trying to figure out what the scripture is. And... Uh, and you can ask me or you can ask Michael because he knows. All right. So let's see where we're at with our current milestone, 7,933. Drum roll. We are at, oh, we are at Google Error. There it is. Okay. <laughs> 7,389 hours. Hallelujah. That's too funny. 7,389 hours of praying tongues. We are closing in on our next milestone. Keep praying. Keep entering your hours. Keep pushing. Um, I think, Janice, you kind of had it figured out that, that it, it – Second week in February is the goal, that's two, two years when we started, to get to the 9,999. So she kind of put some information on there about uh, what it would take for us as a congregation to get to that. I think it is, is very reachable and reasonable, but we have to be careful when the, when the holidays come in and everyone's busy and stuff not to, not to taper down but to ramp it up. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay. I think that is it for announcements here. Let me just get to this here. Push my buttons. And all right, you guys ready for the word? You guys excited for the word? Well, you should be doubly excited because tonight I'm not preaching. 
Hallelujah. You could have booed. You could have been like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. No. You know, because Pastor Sarah is preaching, so you guys just stand to your feet and welcome her. She brings the word, and she brings the fire. Hallelujah. Come on, give Jesus praise. Come on, give him praise. I got to tell you, Steve didn't know I was going to put this on, and he prophesied fire. Sophia didn't know I was going to put this on, and she sang about fire. Amen. I'm wearing every single prophetic thing I got right now. I got this. This is a key. This key has a lion on it. Come on, the key, the key to our next season. It's also got a fire, it's a fiery lion. It's a key to our next season. I'm wearing this, which was given to me tonight by Donna. This is to remind me not to look back to the past. This, we're not looking back to the past, we're looking forward, amen? We're going forward. We've got some lions and some fire. We're going forward. And I don't even remember, I can't even remember, somebody along the way last week or a week ago or three, it might have been three weeks ago, prophesied about fire mantles. And I looked up on Amazon while in church. I had it in my cart while I was in church because I needed a fire mantle. Come on. Now, I had about 12 of them in the cart. This is the one I chose. I think this kind of fits me. You know, got to have some fire, got to have a mantle. All right, so praise the Lord. Come on, give him some more praise. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I got to tell you, this is kind of, it sounds like an exaggeration, and I don't know that I'll be able to explain why even but this word has been 10 years in the making 10 years of cycles of frustrations of crazy stuff of warring of not warring of sitting back of sleeping on my bed of curling up on the shower floor and weeping and saying god where are you 10 years in the making you see, we started ministry not as high as Floodgates ministry nine-ish so years ago. We started that ministry in a bit of a wilderness season, and I have found myself in recent months and weeks thinking, man, have we been in, it's felt like we've been at war for 10 full years. It's felt like we've been at war for 10 full years. And I'm not, being, I'm not exaggerating because you become a warrior for God and you become a person who starts to understand a little bit about warfare. I'm telling you, all of a sudden, you do some warfare. But even though there was warfare coming against me for 10 years, I wasn't warring the whole time. Let's be real. There... I remember, I don't even know, it was several years ago, one of my words, it might have even been one of my words of the Lord for the year that we were going to have a season of rest, that we had crossed over into the promised land and we had taken the land and we were going to rest. And guess what? That was 40 years of rest. And I was hanging on to that word. We were going to have 40 years of rest, right? And I feel like the warfare ramped up. I think it ramped up. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to get sympathy tonight. I'm just trying to tell you the reality of the situation. In the meantime, I, uh, I've been noticing this kind of cycle. It's almost like a 10-year cycle. You see, we've got these prophetic words that we have. We hang on to them. These prophetic words have been spoken over Minnesota that we have heard spoken over Minnesota. Some of them with our own ears. Some of them that we've read through. Some of them that we realize happened, you know, like however long ago and they got dates on them. And, so, and 
now it's just been interesting because people start prophesying, prophets start prophet, prophesying over Minnesota again. And you know what? It's a 10-year cycle. They prophesied in 2000, they prophesied in 2010, there was a little bit of a 2015 thing, and they haven't prophesied since. What is going on? It's 10 years, and I've been sitting with the Lord, and I'm like, what is going on with this? What is happening? It feels like there's this 10-year cycle. Have I really been warring for 10 years? And then Lana Vazer sends out a word, Literally, like, the first few lines is something like, some of you have felt like you've been in war and war has been coming against your purpose for 10 years. And that would be Lana for you. So I was like, praise the Lord. But the word is that we're going to finally conquer. We're going to finally conquer. I'm telling you, I got like 30 pages of notes here, so buckle up. I don't honestly know that I'm going to even look at any of them because I just got things to say. Amen? Yeah. Lana said that we're going to conquer. We're going to finally conquer after this warfare has been coming against us for 10 years. We are going to finally conquer. But how many of you know... Conquering doesn't mean we get to lay down and rest. Conquering means we war some more, but this time it's going to work. This time we're not going to survive. We're going to thrive. We're not going to just survive with the enemy coming against us and the enemy coming against us. I'm telling you, I learned a lot about warfare because God has downloaded, has given me, has given me crazy strategy, has taught me a whole pile of stuff, has had me doing things that people thought I was loony in the brain. And maybe I am a little bit. But hey, I'm wearing some fire tonight. And the truth is, it was a season of learning. It was a season where we learned how to war, and we learned how to not war, and we learned what happened when we didn't war, and we learned what laying down meant. Uh, all of it. All of it. Amen? Amen? And yet, we come around the cycle. We come around the cycle. We come around, and God protects us, and God keeps us, and we're okay on the other side of the cycle, and then we start the cycle over. That, guess what? According to Lana, it's time to conquer. We will conquer, but that means we have to war a little more. <laughs> That means we have to war a little more. That's prophetic because I rhymed, amen. So I've been sitting on this. I've been having some Holy Spirit frustration. I've been... I mean, because something's got to give. Something's got to give. We got promises. We're already healed. We're already delivered. We're already uh, uh, breaking through. There are promises that are our promises. We're blood-bought, covenant believers. But sometimes we haven't seen the promises manifest. And I asked God, what, what is going on? And I heard him say, it's a time to war. It's a time for war. And I was like, oh, no. I don't think I can war anymore. I'm tired of warring. And you want to know what that means? That is a good indication. It's probably a good... Well, it's basically, if you're tired of it, that means it's time to war. <laughs> because that means it's the enemy trying to stop you from doing the very thing that's going to break you through. If you've been a little frustrated, it may have been the Holy Spirit trying to get you to move, trying to get you to do something, trying to get you to change something. 
It might have been the atmosphere. It might have been the state. It might have been the stronghold over this region. Believe it or not, there's a few of them. There's a few. A few strongholds. Real interestingly, there's different strongholds here than there is in St. Cloud. I thought, oh boy, we're going to go from St. Cloud and we're going to come here and it's going to be real easy because we've, we've met all these big guys before. Yeah, no, they're different guys. <laughs> they're, different, they're different princes and powers and rulers and some of them are similar because, hey, they're over the whole state. <sighs> Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And if we go to the end of that kind of thing, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. I'm here to tell you tonight it is a time to war. And there's a few hints. There's a few hints hanging around in the atmosphere. Weariness. Non-stop opposition. Being overwhelmed. Having a really hard time praising. Man, you guys broke through tonight. You did. There was a breakthrough in praise tonight. I've been praying there would be a break. I would have been praying that the fire would hit some people. Now, some of you are good. Some of you need a little more, but we can all get better. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There were two times. There were two times in the Word when people had to war. Two different scenarios. There might be more, but these are the two main scenarios, right? The two main scenarios. We got to go to the Word. I'm going to do a whole lot of Word tonight. Why? I'm telling you, I am breaking down a stronghold tonight. Now, some of you, I'm breaking down a stronghold in you, and I am not ashamed to say it. Because some of you have lived in these walls for so long, you don't even know you got it. But if we break down... If we break down the stronghold in each of us individually, then how much easier can we break down the walls of this entire region? How much easier? I saw in the spirit, it was Sunday morning, maybe two weeks ago, I saw the walls of Jericho in a whole different light. You know, Jericho was a walled city. That means every single person in there was in a stronghold. And what did they do to tear down that stronghold of that city? Well, first they were quiet a little bit for a while. They had to quit their complaining and quit their talking bad about things. But once they got that worked out, it was a shout. It was a sound. It was a trumpet blast that tore down the wall, the stronghold of the city. It's a time to war. Everybody got quiet when I said about the shout. I don't know. See, we're, we're going to break down some strongholds tonight. So the two times, I said this, two times that they would war, number one was to take territory. When they needed to take territory, they would war. Now, when the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan and they walked, can you imagine? This has been prophesied. A whole generation wandered. Now we're finally crossing over. We get to the Jordan. All sorts of crazy fun stuff happens. The priests step in. The water goes back. We walk through on dry land. Guess what we got to do now? Fight some more wars. Fight some more battles. Why? Because we got to take territory. Amen? We got to take some territory. And, you know, we've been taking territory for 10 years. Part of the warfare that's come against high praise, part of the warfare that's been coming against you, part of the warfare that's been coming against this state is because we're taking territory. The people who understand what's happening and see it for what it is are taking territory. I hope that tonight you will start, if you haven't, to understand and see it for what it is. Because there's been a war over your life, there's been a war over your family's life, there's been a war over this region, and there's been a war 
war over this state, whether you like it or not. So you can decide if you're going to step back and you're going to let the enemy do what the enemy does or we're going to be the group of people, whether it be small, who gets it and stands up and listens to the word of the Lord and fights. Taking territory. The second reason why people warred was because the enemy was just trying to cause them ruckus. Now, how that would look in these days is the enemy just wants to come against your calling, what you're doing, how you're doing it, all of that kind of stuff. He just wants to cause you problems. And you know what happens then? You can sit back and take it or you can war. But what I saw there, I don't know if any of you remember, it was over a little over a year ago, Pro, uh, Apostle Robert prophesied, I think it was from this pulpit, that we were in a season of double doors. There was two double doors, there were double doors, and those double doors, there was going to be so much glory that we couldn't contain it. And the Lord has been giving me words about glory and the 120, the 120 priests who would praise until the glory came when the temple was finally built. And when the glory came, then they sacrificed, and they did it again, and all of Israel saw the glory you see there was a small group there was a remnant who was willing to do the work who was willing to get it who was willing to be the one who would maybe sacrifice a little longer who would maybe put aside themselves and their stuff a little bit more so that they could praise so that they could seek the glory of God and it would fill not just the temple but the entire region and the Lord had given me a word that we're going to see a glory habitation upgrade. You see, somewhere way back at high praise, maybe six, seven years ago, the Lord said that we were going from visitation to habitation. And that meant the Lord wasn't going to just visit us with his glory, but he was going to inhabit that place. The Bible says he inhabits our praise. That means every single time you praise, if you fill an atmosphere with praise, he inhabits it. This is a house of praise. He is inhabiting this. But not only that, what I saw in the spirit was pillars, pillars all over the entire middle of central Minnesota and Minnesota. Those were the places. Those were the buildings that God was inhabiting. But what was happening is they were the 120s that were willing to fill that temple with the glory. But they were going to do what had to be done to see that glory fill the entire region. I'm here to tell you tonight, if you're in this house, you better say, I'm the 120. I'm the 120. You're the 120. So the two reasons, taking new territory and, and, uh, and the enemy coming. Oh, this, taking back what is rightfully ours as covenant blood wash. So taking new territory and taking back what is rightfully ours is another reason why we war. Okay, so here's the thing. In the history of high praise for 10 years, man, we have seen so much crazy, good, amazing, miraculous stuff. God gave us a $460,000 building. You're sitting in it. We paid $47 for this building, and it's paid off. We have seen people get brain cancer surgery in the glory with a scar and the Mayo doctor said I don't know what to tell you you don't have cancer you got a little scar like somebody did some surgery or something I and the, the doctor's report prior to that was we can't operate this is not a something men can do surgery on hey guess what God did surgery on it we've seen breast cancer healed we've seen pancreatic cancer healed we've seen lupus healed we've seen legs grow out we've seen allergies healed come on we forget about the allergies there's this lady who had this terrible allergy she could not wear clothes she could not go grocery shopping at walmart or Kohl's because of the insecticide that they would put on their clothes when they would send them overseas because they don't want to send the insects overseas with the clothes. And some of that clothes has insecticide on them. She was so deathly allergic to it, she went into Kohl's and had to use eight EpiPens. They almost lost her. Anytime somebody gave her a gift, they had to do this whole process to get rid of this stuff in the clothes so they didn't kill her. 
Guess what? She was healed. God healed her at high praise. She didn't, te she didn't test it right away, thank the Lord. Eventually, she figured it out. Why is it a time to war and what am I saying? It's a time to war, but more specifically, it is a time to war with the prophetic words that have been spoken over you individually. I don't know about you, but I've sort of sat back and thought, and you know, well, I'll just put it this way. We are a prophetic church. You come every single week, you get a prophetic word. Whether you know it or not, pro you get a prophetic word. You come to this building, you get a prophetic word. But then beyond that, you have prophetic words that have been spoken over you personally. Then beyond that, there's prophetic words that have been spoken over this church. So many. I mean, like hundreds. And then there's prophetic words that have been spoken over this, the city. And then there's prophetic words that have been spoken over the state. And then there's some pro prophetic words that have been spoken over the nation. And then sometimes I think it'd just be easier to have a few less prophetic words. It gets a little overwhelming sometimes, right? Like, how do I keep track of all these prophetic words? What, well, how do I war with which one at what time? And how am I? And, you know, so then if you're like me, you're just like, whatever. I don't know if I want to war with any prophetic word right now. And yet the Lord has been having me come back to some of the prophetic words. In fact, I found this whole, I didn't know I had it. I found this whole binder of prophetic words that had been spoken in the services at high praise in like 2000, well, like 10 years ago. And prophetic words that had been released over high praise. And Lord was like, I need you to war with these things. Have you seen these things come to pass? Is there anybody in this house that's had prophetic words spoken over them that haven't come to pass yet? What Paul told Timothy, Paul told Timothy his son, his spiritual son, he said... This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. In other words, you wage warfare with your prophecies. Part of the reason God gives you prophecies is to wage warfare. Part of the reason God gives us prophetic words over the state is so that prophetic people will stand up and do something with them. The thing about prophecy is so many people misunderstand because it hasn't been taught well. That prophetic words don't just mean something is going to happen. Prophetic words are the will of God for something to happen. Prophetic words are our charge to stand up and do something to see something happen. Not to force it. But there's things that we are supposed to do. I'll never forget when Dutch and Chuck came up one time. These re they kept coming, right? They come and they release the word. And they come and there's a whole book written about words that Chuck, Dutch and Chuck released over Minnesota. It's quite fascinating. But the last time they came, and I remember it so vividly because I'm like, do we really need to go hear them tell us the same thing again? Are we already know what Dutch and Chuck have prophesied over Minnesota. And yet hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people show up to see Dutch and Chuck again to prophesy. Now, I don't have anything against that. Maybe most of those hundreds of people didn't hear them the first four times. And that's fine. Maybe we need to hear it again. But I remember thinking in my mind, I wonder if they're going to tell us anything new. Because what have we done with what we already got? And essentially, much more politely and better than me, you know, because people didn't freak out and run away. They said, do something with the words we already given you. God told you to do stuff. Do it. And you know what? I don't think they've been back. Now, I think they are coming back now, but I don't think they've been back since then. We need to wage warfare with the words that have been spoken over you personally, over this church. If you consider this your church, I would appreciate if you would help me some wage some warfare. Because we need some warfare to be taking place. Over your families. And hey, guess what? Over this state. And we are in a very serious moment. We need to not sleep. It's not time to sleep.
Joel 3, 9 says, proclaim this among the nations. By the way, you're the nations tonight, and I'm going to proclaim it. Prepare for war. Wake up, mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. Are there any mighty men and women of God in this house? A few of you. There's a couple of you. God says, wake up. God says, wake up. Now, I thought that this was a little bit, I don't know, I was like going back and forth about whether I should preach this or not, or whether it was really God, because that's really what the enemy does, right? You get really excited about something, and then he comes in like, oh, that's not the Lord. Oh, that's not God. You want to know what somebody said to me when they came in last night? They, they're like, you know, I'm just so frustrated. There is nobody in this town who knows how to war. like well praise the lord i think you just confirmed something for me and you didn't even know it what i did find out last night however is there are some people in this town that know how to war there were some people in this town last night that knew how to war maybe they never seen it before but why I, I was impressed people knew how to war. They were here, and they were ready, and they were going to war. And I was, thank you. I appreciate it. But that doesn't mean we can't do better right. or more right. or get a different revelation. Because I feel like some people know how to war one way really, really good. This is what I've done for 10 years. But when it comes to something else, well, I don't know. I'm kind of resistant to that. You know, I can... I can pound the floor and I can pray in the spirit and I can make noise that way. But you want me to praise loud? Yeah, maybe that's just not me. Well, are you created by God? <laughs> Psalm 144 says, Blessed be the Lord my rock, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He trains us for war. So what am I getting at? God revealed something to me. He revealed it to me. And guess what? It ain't just Brainerd. It's the whole state. There's a stronghold here. There's a wall here. There's, a, there's some things. And some of you, you don't know that you have parts of it. And you don't know that, you ha you don't know that it's part doing stuff to hold you back but it's here it's here God revealed it to me and it is a resistance against war biblical war there is a resistance there is a yeah I don't really know if I can do it that way there is questions in your mind when Sarah says, let's make some noise so we can break through. And you go, yeah, I can make some noise that break through. But then there's this little back of your mind thing that's, but there was this thing on Facebook and this minister so-and-so said, you know, I got to not, it's not about working it all up or making so much noise or putting on a show. It's not about that. And all of a sudden you pull back because there's a lie that's been planted in your mind. So tonight I'm going to tear down that wall. I'm going to tear down that stronghold. I'm going to tear down that lie. Now I know there are several in here who don't necessarily have that lie. But guess what? It's in there somewhere. It's some way, shape, or form. Somehow it is affecting it because God ordained your steps to be here. So don't be that person who says, this ain't for me. Everybody say, this is for me tonight. Now, it's going to look different for every single person, and it might be, you know, but it is. It's for you. It was for me. It was for Chris. This is for Chris. This is for us. Amen. 
because we're in a season of war. We can't do it just the same way we've done it because we're going to conquer. Yes, we've gone around a cycle, and yes, we've warred, and yes, we've done every strategy known to mankind. We've read every book God showed us to read. We've said everything God showed. We've done every prophetic act God showed us to do, and you know what? He sustained us, and we made it through, but we kept coming around this cycle 10 years, and now it is time to conquer. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, what this stronghold is sometimes, this is the statement I've heard. I heard this statement. I can't find the statement in my notes. But it's perpetuated by this statement or this idea. And that is, and man, I've heard this so many times. <laughs> we war from a place of rest. We need to war from a place of rest. Now, I get what they mean. I get what that's supposed to mean. By the way, even Google AI gets what that's supposed to mean. You would Google it, and the AI gets it right. But I'm telling you, like, three-quarters of brainer don't know what it, said, what it means. They think, I'm going to go lay on my bed and do some war. And it ain't just Brainerd. I'm just not being, I'm not trying to be mean to you. I got to tell you, there's this, I'm going to tell you a story. This was so many years ago, it, and I don't think anybody would know who I'm talking about, but it wasn't here either, so there you go. <clears throat> there was a prayer meeting. It was going to be a 25-hour prayer meeting, 24, 25-hour prayer meeting. And we were invited as a church, knowing full well who we are and what we did, to come and to pray at this prayer meeting. And what would happen is all these different ministries would have like this one hour or two hour time slot. And again, this was in Minnesota, but not anywhere near here. And we were super excited because we're going to come and pray. And, they, and we had been told, we want you to be you. That's always a trap, I'm just going to tell you. You better make sure. Do you know who I am? You better make sure. So it's like sometime we're, we're slot number two. There are 24 slots. There are 24 ministries from Minnesota going to come and pray at this thing. And they're supposed to you be you, right? But the church, the church that's the the leaders of the thing, they got some leadership going on. And this is, this is what's crazy. We were being us for a good long time already within this whole meeting, and people were thrilled. <laughs> I mean, like, people were excited about the fire that we carried and excited about how we did things and excited about our noise, for lack of a better way to put it, right? I mean, they were excited. And then we're getting ready to pray, and the leadership of this church gets up, and he says, you know what? Now remember, we're going to pray first because we're going to set the tone. And when we set the tone, this is what I want you to remember. We war from a place of rest, don't we? So we don't want any of that loud, corrupt, you know, that jumping around, pounding kind of stuff. We don't need any of that yelling, that screaming. We don't need none of that singing and shouting. We don't need any of that because we're, the Bible says we're going to war from a place of rest. I almost rose up and said, no, it does not. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that anywhere. I'm sorry, but it does not. It is just something that prophetic people have been saying in Minnesota, and everybody believes it. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says in Psalm 149 that our praise, which happens to be halal, which happens to be to be clamorously foolish and loud and put on a show before the Lord is what executes written judgment on the enemy. Well, needless to say, we couldn't pray like we pray after that. Now, we prayed, and it was a powerful prayer meeting, and God showed up, and it was beautiful. But guess what happened? People literally, I am not joking. This is the truth. 
people walked in with their pillows and their blankets and laid down on the floor because they were going to war from a place of rest. I'm telling you, that's not what that means. Not what it means. It means that we're going to war, yes, we're going to war with the understanding and the knowing in our knower that Jesus is always victorious. We're going to war with the understanding and the knowing, resting in the fact that our faith is that he wins. It doesn't mean go to sleep. That's not biblical. There's nowhere it's biblical. Do you know what happened with Joshua? Joshua was at war, and Jesus stopped, well, God stopped the sun. And guess what? God intervened, but they, he didn't intervene so they could go to bed. The sun didn't go down. It literally stayed up. They had to war some more. So they could finish the job. God helped them finish the job, but they had to do their part. They had to war. Okay, so I'm taking down a stronghold. We are not warring from a place of rest. Another thing, not in that way. We are warring from a place resting in God's victory. We are not warring from our bedchamber with our head on a pillow. Okay? okay? All right. You won't find that happening here. Now, some of you might be offended by that. I'm not really sorry. I'm just being honest. There is a stronghold. There is a stronghold that any time you're a little bit loud, you're a little bit over the top, you're a little bit emotional, you're a little bit, you move a little too much, you yell a little too much, you make a little too much noise that somehow you're doing it wrong, somehow you're striving, that's the other thing I've heard, you're doing it in your own power, you're do you better be doing it in some power. You better be doing it in some power. If you don't understand how to get into God's power, start with yours and he'll take over. That's really how war worked pretty much every single time in Scripture. They started and he helped. All right? We haven't seen any, every single person healed that walks in this house. We haven't seen above and beyond all that we can ask or think. We haven't seen the shock and awe that's been prophesied over this house. That means shock and awe. I'm sorry, but the Lord says, above and beyond what I can imagine, and you have no idea what I can imagine. Amen. That's what I call shock and awe. And guess what? Jeffrey, some of y'all know Jeffrey, prophesied shock and awe over this house. He's a very, um, very good prophet. He prophesies the truth, I'm just saying. So sometimes the application of warring from a place of rest, I'll go with misunderstood, is misunderstood. And I am sorry, but the enemy is taking full advantage of it. He's taking full advantage of it in this state. Because there's a whole lot of prophetic people, and I'm going to go that far, prophetic people who are warring on their be in their bedchambers, laying on their pillow for things over this state, instead of getting the fire under their ever-loving bonds <laughs> and doing something. And I'm sorry, I know that people have different personalities and things and all this kind of stuff. I know, you know? Good. Praise the Lord. But half the time, it's an excuse. I'll go with half. Half the time. More than half, it's an excuse. 
The same people who won't come and shout in church will go to the football game and scream their ever-loving head off until you think they're going to lose their mind. That ain't a personality thing. I don't buy it. I'm speaking to the choir a little bit here. We have to be discerning. I mean, like, most of the time this kind of stuff has been rooted in a real issue, you know? Like, somebody has taken this thing too far, and it has gotten way over the top emotional, or it has gotten way more about just screaming your head off. Or it's a, And you know what? That's true. They're, they're definitely... I've seen a few things in my life that even I went, hmm, you know, where I think that just might be a little not God. But even then, I don't know. And I have to tell you, can I, I don't know if I should say this. Most people who are here tonight in, have been sheltered enough that you haven't seen those extremes the people you have, Chris has seen some of the extremes because he lived in New York City, and he will tell you some stories. I think that there was some extremes going on in our neck of the woods, kind of down the road a little bit when we were growing up. There definitely were some. There are some extremes. We have to be discerning. But the shout to tear down walls is biblical our clap to break down barriers and to put nails in the enemy's head is biblical. Yeah. Our word, our sword, our two-edged sword with our prophetic and our logos word is biblical. Okay. We need to be discerning, but most of the time, most of the time, you are not experiencing those extremes. You will never have, and you probably never will. Praise the Lord. There are some extremes, but most of the time, we can be clamorously foolish before the Lord and still rest knowing he's got it. That's the biblical way to do it. Amen? 2 Corinthians 10.3 says, We walk in the flesh... But we do not war according to the flesh. Now, this is really interesting to me because one of the things, if you want to have the theme, the theme that Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he's all about, get out of the flesh, you people. You're doing all this crazy stuff, and it's all in the flesh. And he's trying to teach them. You know, we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and we do this. In Ephesians, he doesn't have to go that far. He doesn't have to say that. There are, there are, there are sometimes things that are flesh. But I would rather you start in the flesh and get somewhere and let God take over. I feel like we're in a season where that is important. Nothing, oh yeah, by the way, warring, laying on your pillow because you're too tired to stand up or you don't really feel like praising or you don't really feel like jumping or you're a little bit uncomfortable with how this looks or somebody might be looking at you. By the way, that's all flesh too. That's all flesh too. So rather shout and make a noise and not care what anybody says and oops, if I crossed over into the flesh a little bit, well, at least I'm doing something rather than missing out in something that God is going to do because I just don't feel comfortable, which is also flesh. Oh. So, I need to start with some, if we're going to war, we need to talk about some armor. We better not go to war without armor, right? We better have some armor on. You know, in Corinthians, he tells them, enough with the flesh! 
do things decently in order. Ephesians, he says, put on your armor and go to war because we don't fight against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which by you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6, 14. Now, we better talk about that word stand, because here we go again with the excuse that everybody uses. Well, not anybody here. Say, not me. Stand, stand therefore. What does that word stand mean? Stand therefore and then put on your armor. Number one, number one, let's just talk about this. If stand in that particular position meant don't war, whatever you do, don't do anything to war because God, you just trust in God and he's got it. Whatever, he's got you taken care of. You don't have a part to play at all. You just stand there and let him do it. Why would you need armor then? Why would you need armor if that's what that meant? I, I am all for God winning, and he does. But then I don't know why I need armor. So we need a breastplate, a helmet to go to sleep. <laughs> to lay on our pillow. I got to tell you this, though. Put on your full armor, God, before you go to sleep. <laughs> I mean, like, I kind of joke about it, but do. Like, put on the armor of God before you go to sleep. It'll help you sleep, amen? <laughs> Don't ever take it off. Just keep that thing on while you're in your bed. But there's a reason why you need armor. So that word there in the Greek is hista, histami, histami. It is also the same word used in Matthew 12, 24, uh, Matthew 12, 25, where it says, a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. So it's in reference to busting things apart. Why do you need your armor? So you don't get busted apart. Stand means don't just sit and wait. It means get ready, take ground, hold your, hold your position. Hold your position because all hell is about to come against you. Woohoo! It doesn't mean stand still and wait. It means hold your position. It means fight if you need to to keep your position. It's the same Greek word in Matthew 18, 16, where it says... Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. It means fight if you need to, to establish your authority. That's what stand means. That actually stand is actually a word of war, not a word of rest. The whole context. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might to put on the whole. So you got to be strong in the Lord, yes, and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. You're going to stand against him. That is oppositional, not, woo, come at me. God's going to take care of me. I don't have to do nothing. I'm going to sleep. It doesn't mean slumber, sleep, and wait. It means stand your ground, be prepared to defend, and hold on to what has been promised. Defend your territory. And then, if we keep going, when you've done all of that, when you've done all of that, when you've done all of that, Keep standing. When you've done all of that, does it say go to sleep now? No. Keep standing. Keep defending your territory. Keep establishing your authority. Keep 
keep your position. Stand your ground. Hallelujah. Let's talk about some weapons. This is all over the place. We need some weapons. We need some armor and we need some weapons. First, we got the belt of truth. Now, I'm telling you, Chris has preached a huge long message about this, so I'm going to do it super fast. So this is like the overarching, woo, get her done quest. Fast thing. Belt of truth. Biblical truth. I'm going to give you a belt today. This is, this is putting on your belt. This is what I'm doing right now. I'm telling you the truth. Sometimes people don't tell you the truth. Because you get offended and mad at them. Say, not me. me. I'm telling you the truth. So if you take the truth, that helps your belt. You know what your belt does? It keeps your pants on. (laughs) Keeps your pants on. It keeps your position because you're not worried. Oh, yeah. It keeps you from being a fool. If you are believing a lie in any way, your belt is how you keep. If the lies come against you, you have the belt of truth, so you're not going to go the fool way. It also provides protection for important areas. It protects your bloodline. I'll just put it that way. You can think prophetically. Your ability to reproduce is related to your belt of truth. Amen? All right, your breastplate of righteousness. There's two parts. There's a front, there's a back. One part is your righteousness that you have because Jesus shed blood on the cross and you have made him the Lord of your life and you couldn't earn it and you didn't do nothing and that's one part. The other part is you walking in righteousness, you walking in, uh, in that righteousness. You know, you get what I'm saying? Two parts. And uh, this protects your heart and internal organs. It's most important for protecting your life um, internally and your spiritual life. So your breastplate protects life. Your belt of truth protects your delicate places. It protects your bloodline and it keeps you from being a fool. Faith is a shield. It protects you against arrows and darts that the enemy is sending your way. It protects against word curses and lies, but it also protects protects abundant life we have abundant life because of faith right it protects abundant life this is also a weapon and it so it's a shield but it's also a weapon and is used for casting down arguments taking out thoughts captive in other words overcoming our flesh our faith helps with that now you know what we have our shield right and the darts are coming, and darts are coming, and it's protecting us. But it's also kind of a weapon, right? Because you use your shield. You move that thing around. You put it in position. Faith is a shield. Your salvation. Jesus is the Lord of your life. That's your helmet. It protects your mind, your senses, your gates. What we see, what we hear, what we know, that helps with your, that's your salvation. Amen? There's weapons mentioned in the armor. There's the sword of the Spirit. That's the Word of God. Psalm 149 calls it a two-edged sword. There are two Greek words used for the word word. Okay? And that's, it says that the sword is the word. Right? The sword is the word. It says that in a couple different places. I don't know if I got to that part in the word. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6.14. Okay. You have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of the God. There are two Greek words for the word word that are used. Rhema. I know some of you have heard this before. I'm going to say it again. Logos. Logos is the written word of God. Written down in the Bible, logos. Rhema is when you take that written word and you speak it out, when you preach it, when you prophesy, when you speak um, like revelation, that's going to be rhema. When you put the two together, you got the sword with two edges. Oh, yes, the sword. You got a logos. You got a rhema. Now, if you got one edge of the sword, like some denominations, well, that's not completely true because they have revelation and they still preach. But you have one most of the edge of the sword, 
that's kind of useful. It will cut some things, but you got two edges of that sword. That is, that's a good weapon right there. Amen? You got your prophetic word that lines up with your written word. Prophetic word. Now, Paul says he doesn't want you to be ignorant. And I know that most people in this place wouldn't do this. But I'm going to just say it anyway because I don't want you to be ignorant either. I got to tell you, it took me a long time to get to realize this. So I'm just going to say it. When it's talking about the written word of God, and Jesus is talking about the written word of God, he is talking about the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Because the New Testament did not exist yet. So when he's talking about using the sword, now don't go off and say I'm a heretic or something because you're not supposed to use the New Testament. Don't. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, by the way, the Old Testament is as important as the New Testament when we're talking about the sword. I don't know. There seems to be a group of people who will come at me and say, every scripture you used was the Old Testament. And all I want to say is, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Everything you preached was the Old Testament. What would Jesus do? Go check it out. Oh, wait. Everything he preached was the Old Testament? And Rhema Word. Everything he preached... He heard the father say, so that was prophecy. And by the way, it lined up with scripture, which at the time was the Old Testament. Hmm. Sorry. Mic drop. I have to tell you, it, it was only very recently that I realized this. And it was probably because somebody said that to me. Every scripture you used was in the Old Testament. Praise the Lord. I'm doing it like Jesus then. All right, I don't even know where we are. The shoes shod with the gospel of peace. I don't even know if I even got to that one. The shoes are shod with the gospel of peace. Your shoes are your foundation and... Your gospel is the foundation. The good news is your foundation. They're shod with that. The gospel of peace is kind of interesting because, oh boy, we could go back to are we going to war or are we going to be peaceful? There's a time for war and a time for peace. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay. Um, so related to our sword, I don't know. Oh, there's the pillow of praise. So, you know, like, okay, in Roman... Chris preaches about this. I can't preach the whole message. I'm just saying. In Roman armor, there was a pillar, a pillum. There was a sword, and there was a pillum. And the pillum went further, farther, and would go up in the air and go. So there's the sword, which was the word. And interestingly, huh? It's a spear. The pillum was your praise. So you had the sword, which was the word, and the pillum, which was the praise. Okay, you might just have to trust me on that because that was like Chris's message, not mine. So the weapons, the sword, the word, other spiritual weapons. So related to the sword is our decree. And if you've been around this place very long, you know that we like the decree. The prophetic decree is a very important spiritual weapon. And we see it in Job twenty two twenty eight. 28. You will declare that actually is decree a thing and it will be established for you. Hey, look at that word established again. That will be established for you. It is, that is, however, a Hebrew word and the other one was Greek. So light will shine on your ways. Who would like to have light shine on their way? The decree also was a warfare strategy that kings used. And what they would do, because well, so this was the thing. The king would decree a thing, and it was established. That was a kingly, what? Law thing. So 
what would happen is if a law needed to be made or something that needed to be established or something needed to be taken care of, the king would legally write it out or legally say it, and then it would be written down, and then he would seal it with his signet ring, and it couldn't be revoked. It was not revoked. In Esther 8.8, 8, it says, You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. Do you know that you have the authority of the king of kings? and the Lord of Lords to write a decree and seal it with the king's signet ring, which is his blood because you are blood-bought child of God. And if you do that, it is legal and binding, and no one can revoke it. Amen. Now, it was a couple of weeks, I don't know, like a couple months ago, the Lord said, remind the king. He said, remind the king. And I was like, what does that mean? And I was like, I don't get it. And he started to bring me through all these different places. You see, it was a legal and binding document that the king made a decree. But what would happen sometimes is time would pass and different kings would come along and they would forget what the legal and binding thing was. And in order for the, for the particular promise to be held, you had to remind the king. We've seen it in Nehemiah. We've seen it in Ezra. They had to go back and remind the king multiple times, hey, Look, this decree was made by a king, and it's legal and binding, and we have to do this thing because <laughs> it was made by a king. The Lord said, remind the king. Part of our warfare is the decree, but sometimes we need to remind the king. What does that mean? Do you all have, do you all have your prophetic little antenna up right now? Is there some prophetic? Is the, do you all hear in this prophetically? Esther says, you yourselves write the decree. But on top of that, the word also says that you're kings and priests. You yourselves write the decree in the authority of the king. In the king's name, you write the decree in the king's name. In Jesus' name, you write the decree. You seal it with the king's signet ring for whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the signet ring. No one, say no one. No one. No one can revoke this is a powerful weapon but sometimes we need to remind the king a decree a decree written in the name of the king is legal and binding and you have authority here's where it's legal and binding it's legal and binding in the courts of heaven and if we're talking about warfare it's legal and binding it is written judgment that decree that you've written is written judgment usually against some kind of enemy. You write the decree for health, it's written judgment against the sickness. You write the decree for family restoration, it's written judgment against the enemy that is working against your family. You write the decree for breakthrough of any kind, it's written judgment against the enemy that's trying to come against that thing. Now, what's really helpful in that written decree is to have yourself a sword in there where you have, like, let's say you're actually going to the court in, in the natural. What do you have? You have witnesses and you have um, evidence. Well, what can be your evidence? Well, we got the sword here. Well, my, the word of God, it's nice to put some of that in there. That helps you remind the king sometimes. But the written decree is legal and binding in the courts of heaven. It is a written judgment. Well, guess what? We go over to Psalm 149, and it says that our praise, praise the Lord. I'm just going to sing, do the whole thing. I'm going to write the whole, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I don't know where it is in my notes. Can I read it up there? Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise. In the assembly of the saints, let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Uh-oh. Let the high praises of God. The high praises of God be in their mouth. A two-edged sword in their hand. To do what? To execute vengeance on the nations. 
and punishments on the peoples to bind their kings with chains, their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all the saints. Praise the Lord. You write a decree, and part of how you execute it is your praise. The high praises of God. Part of how you execute that written decree. And by the way, if you're praying a faith prayer, you're praying according to the word, you're praying something out in faith, you're speaking it out, you got your sword, but essentially it's a decree. And if you're saying it, you might as well consider it written judgment in the courts of heaven. And how come some of it isn't coming to pass? Because we don't know how to re execute that written judgment. Maybe, maybe we're too tired to execute that written judgment today. Maybe work has been a little too much this week to execute that written. I mean, like, if you get this... Because we don't feel like warring. I don't feel like warring. But that's the best indication that it's a time of war. So what am I talking about? Our praise. Praise is a weapon. And y'all have heard me preach this a thousand different ways and times. You can even praise on your bed if you want to. Laying in your bed. You can get it all done at once. Amen. You want to bring your pillow? Praise. Amen? Just do it loud. Okay. <clears throat> King Jehoshaphat sent praisers out before the weapons. Here's the thing, though. He still sent the weapons. The praise is what confused the enemy. The army went behind them. They didn't have to use those other weapons because the praise was, was the weapon. Amen? King Jehoshaphat... He got that strategy by listening to the prophet, by the way. They had themselves a little glory night, and the prophet told them to do this, and they did, and they got a strategy, and it worked. The prison was open, and chains fell off because of praise. And if you read that story, the chains fell off of the guys that were praising, but they also fell off of everybody else in prison. You want to know what? Those guys in prison did bad stuff. That's why they were in prison. They did bad stuff. They weren't believers. They weren't following the Lord. They did. They were converted. But hey, guess what? The chains fell off of them while they were still in their place, while they were still lost. Why? Because two guys had the gumption to make a sound and praise the Lord when they were in prison. Hallelujah. Praise brought down the walls of Jericho. Praise can bring down the walls around Brainerd. Praise binds up high-ranking principalities and powers. Praise causes Jesus to rise up as a man of war and turn some tables. How many of you know, I missed this scripture, um, Psalm 8-2, Psalm 8-2, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Why? Because of your enemies. Hey, guess what? Strength has been ordained because of our enemies, that we may silence the enemy and avenger. Interestingly enough, this is Psalm 8 2, but Matthew 21 16, Jesus, he has, okay, so he's come into, this is, the, this is what happened. I know I've said this before, but some of you need to hear it again. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and they are praising him like they have never praised him before. There is a ruckus. There is a noise. People didn't know what that noise was. People were drawn to find out what was going on because there was such a noise. There was, it was so loud. They were shouting. They were yelling, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. And he comes into town 
And then he goes up into the temple, and then he starts causing some ruckus and turning over some tables and healing some people and doing some things. And they say, Jesus, what got into you? What happened? What's going on? Why are you doing this? And he quotes Psalm 8 too, but here he says, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected, that's the Greek version of the Hebrew word perfected also means ordained or in other words given us this important thing praise it the psalm says strength Jesus says praise do you think he misquoted the psalm you think Jesus misquoted that psalm so what does strength and praise they're the same word they mean the same thing Guess what? You need some strength. You do some praise, praise, and you get some strength. Strength and some praise, praise and some strength. But not only that, God gave it to you. From the time you were born, he put it in you. He made it, made you that way. I go back to, did God make you or not? Out of the mouth of infants. And nursing babes, he has ordained praise. That means it was ordained in you since you were an infant, a child, a baby. You were made that way. Have I convinced you yet? All right. Finally, a few more things because I got to quit. Strategy. Strategy is an important element of war. We need, we got our armor, we got some weapons, we need strategy. Now this is what can happen when we get excited about going to war, is we start warring against everything and all things and anything, and we do all this stuff and we never ask God. And what can happen is you can bring a whole bunch of warfare against you that you were never meant to take. And hey, we got enough warfare coming against us that we were meant to do. We don't need everybody else's and all the other kind of things, okay? You need to get a strategy. So that's real easy. You say, God, what's the strategy? You ask him. Ask him first. Ask him first. That's all I'm asking. Ask him first. Now, we get zealous and we get excited and we're going to war. And there's so, there are some people right now, not as many in Minnesota, but this is a problem. This is the other side of this stronghold because I've seen this in other places. They are so excited to war that they're just warned against anything that wiggles. And next thing you know, they got all this warfare coming against them that wasn't theirs to begin with. And they are getting beat up. There is a balance. There's something in between. And we need to stay in our strategy that the Lord has given us. Okay? Strategy. Strategy is an important part of war. Agreement is an important part of war. Matthew 18, 19. I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning, everybody say, anything. anything. If any, if two of you agree on earth concerning a few things, a thing here or there, one thing or another, anything that they ask, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. Anything. Okay, so that actually is like a pretty loaded thing, by the way. Agreement is so loaded. God, when they were going to build the Tower of Babel, God had to mess it up because he said, these guys are in so much agreement, anything is possible to them. You know what that means? Any bad thing is possible if you're in agreement. Any good thing is possible if you're in agreement. Anything in between is possible if you're in agreement. We better be in agreement on the right thing. Amen? Anything is possible. All right, and finally, praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Is this a weapon? Kind of. And so much more. Now, I'm not going to give you all the word of this because you all, you, if you will need word, go look it up. Praise the Lord. Study it. Hallelujah. Come to the class. I have given you lots and lots of word, okay, because we're breaking down strongholds. I'm taking this sword tonight, and I'm cutting down the wall. But I'm, not, I'm just going to fly through these. 
Praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is the perfect prayer for the specific time and the place you're in. If we are in a season of war, praying in the Spirit will be the perfect prayer to war with. It is also perfect agreement in a good way. When I say, everybody pray in the Spirit, everybody, everybody pray in the Spirit, like in the, when I say that during worship or whatever, you're praying the perfect prayer for the moment in perfect agreement. That's what's happening there. That's pretty cool. And guess what? Agreement breaks the oak, causes the oil flow, do a hum Herman, which is revival. Yay, praise the Lord. Agreement is important. Okay, the thing to do, praying in the Spirit, is the thing to do when we don't know what to pray. How many times have you been like, I'm just at a loss. I don't know what to pray. I don't have the words. I don't have, praying, pray in the Spirit. Pray, this is praying in tongues, if you need me to say it like that. If we need to make sure we aren't warring in the flesh, by the way, I talked about warring in the flesh or warring in the Spirit, right? How do you make sure you're not warring in the flesh? You start by praying in the Spirit. It's pretty much a guarantee. If you're praying in the Spirit and that's where you start, you're not warring in the flesh. Praying in the Spirit always puts our spirit above the flesh. If we need energy, if we need to be built up, if we're feeling weary, we need our batteries charged, we don't feel like it, we don't feel like warring, pray in the Spirit. That's what it means. It means it edifies you. It edifies you. It charges your batteries. It, here's what I got to tell you. If you need that, pray in the Spirit more. If you're feeling weary, pray in the Spirit more. Do you know that you can pray in the Spirit like all day, every day? You can pray in the Spirit while you're doing everything. You can pray, because it's separate, you can pray in the Spirit while you're reading. You can pray in the Spirit while you're washing dishes. You can pray in the Spirit while you're walking down the street. You're walking the dog. You can pray in the Spirit. You are feeling weary or broken or tired. I've got to tell you, I had three weeks of feeling weary, broken, tired, unhappy, couldn't figure out what was going on, all of a sudden I'm like, I haven't prayed in the spirit, like literally have not, have not put in hours for days. I'm a person who puts in hours. Why? Because I need to. It's my mental health. Pray in the spirit and then put in your hours. I have to just help, hold back a little bit because a few people here and there, they're like, I, be, I pray in the Spirit. Now I've not entered my hours, but I've been praying in the Spirit a whole lot. I'm like, okay. Why not? For real. I love you. Put your hours in. We have a goal here. All right, sorry. Okay. When you feel like I just did, you're going to scream your ever-loving head off. Pray in the Spirit. If you need strategy, strategy, pray in the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will bring it to you. If you need prophetic utterance for your sword, start by praying in the Spirit. Right? Because your sword, you need, maybe you have to have a prophetic side or a prophetic revelation or an understanding to your word side. Man, I found this part of the Bible and it's so cool. And, but how do I finish my sword? Pray in the Spirit. You need to write a written decree? Pray in the Spirit. He'll give it to you. You need more power for battle? Pray in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is an important part of this. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you better let us know. This is a tongue-talking church. And you know what? Sometimes people say you need to tarry and you need to wait. And guess what? They are ready, tarried, and waited. That's what happened in the upper room. After the upper room, after they tarried and they waited, it's now ours whenever we need it. You don't need to wait like they did. Praise the Lord. 
Now, sometimes part of our mind gets in the way or there's some deliverance that's needed or there's this or there's that, but that isn't because you need to tarry. That's a lie from the enemy, and as long as you believe it, you won't break through. Could be a stronghold. Um, so, praise the Lord. It's a time of war. Now, what are we going to do with this? What are we going to do with this? Well, what the Lord had shows, has shown me that we're going to do the next couple weeks, maybe one, maybe two, I don't know. We literally could do this for the rest of the year, is we're going to go back. We're going to look at prophetic words that have been spoken over this church and yes, we are going to look at prophetic words that have been spoken over this church. If you believe that high praise is your church, praise the Lord. If you love high praise and you get fed here and you think it's a good place and you think revival might happen here because God said it, praise the Lord. And then you can come and you can war with the prophetic words that have been spoken over this place. Amen? If you don't think high praise is your church, that's fine too, but praise the Lord. But God has said some things about high praise. And you can come and you can war with us. And hey, that could just add to the unity, which breaks yokes and causes things to happen. And amen. Um, we're also maybe going to take a week or two and we're going to look at prophetic words that have been spoken over Minnesota. Because here's the thing. There's a lot of people who know that there's been words spoken and we've alluded to them here and there. We're going to actually look at the fullness of some of these words. Because... There's a lot to them. I was going through some of these ones, and man, there's some things in this last Dutch and Chuck word, or what, actually it wasn't the last one, it was like 2003. I'm telling you, I didn't know those things were in there. We're talking like bio-warfare and like some crazy stuff. And then there's some things that Cindy Jacob has said recently that, by the way, she said over Minnesota 10 years ago, 10-year cycle, and we're experiencing 10 years in advance of what the whole rest of the world is about to if they don't get their stuff together. And then there's some words about how Minnesota, how it goes in Minnesota goes the whole nation. So how about we get it right so that the whole nation can go that way? Amen? There's some words about, um, uh, there's one about a, uh, some kind of speech that's going to be made here that's going to shift the whole nation. And I've been trying to go back in history and see if that happened, but I don't think it's happened. There's um, a bunch of different things. There's things that probably you don't know have been spoken over the state you live in. And some of you maybe weren't even prophetic people for the whole 10 years or 20 years that some of these words have been out there. And hey, it'll be fun and I don't know, I, I don't know how it's going to look, but God wants us to revisit some of these words. Not because we're going backwards, but because we're going forwards. And it's time to war with the prophetic word. God says we need to war with the prophetic words that have been, been spoken over us. And here's the thing. I feel like as we do that with Minnesota and as we do that with this church, you're going to see some strategies. Some things are going to hit you know, like home, and you're going to be like, I could do that with that prophetic word that was spoken over my family. Or, or remember, go back and, you know, while you're waiting for next week, if you got some prophetic words recorded, go back and revisit them. Chris and I do that every now and then, and we listen to them, and we're like, man, we thought we knew every single thing that was said in this word, like we could repeat it. And then there's some little thing that we missed, or some little that's coming to pass right now, or it's just a really cool thing to do. If you got those, you got them written down someplace, you got recordings. We still got recordings on cassette tapes. I don't even know if we can play those things. Go back and listen to them. It's going to be fun. And you know what? It's going to be a fun season of war because we're going to be reminded of all the cool things that God has said, and we're going to see some of these things come to pass because Lana said we're not going around this cycle again. We are conquering. We're conquering. It's time to conquer. Amen. 
Hallelujah. So I thank you, Lord, for every single person who is here. I thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. I thank you, Lord, that your word does not return void. I thank you, Lord, that a sword has gone forth tonight and a fire that will break down strongholds. I thank you, Lord, that if there was any strongholds represented here, they don't exist anymore. I thank you, Lord, that people's minds are being moved to your mind and your will and your way in every possible way, whether they knew that they needed it or not. Even even us, even me, even Chris. Lord, I thank you that you are giving us a new perspective, that you're giving us a new strategy, that you're giving us a new fire, that you're giving us a new zeal. I thank you, Lord, that you have said it is a time to war, but you have said that if we do, we will conquer. And we war with that prophetic word in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that the enemy that has been holding this region back, the enemy that has been holding this state back is coming down in the name of Jesus because you are rising up a group of people who knows how to war and we thank you for it in Jesus name Lord I bind up and I break the power of any retribution retaliation revenge and interference I say that every single person here is safe I say we dwell in the secret place of the most high under the shadow of the almighty and no evil can come near our dwelling place our houses our homes our bodies our cars our appliances our pets or anything that you have made us stewards over in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that in that secret place we are covered, we are protected, and this retribution that continues to come is conquered in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that the enemy can have no hold on anyone who has been here tonight just because we're talking about fixing him. <laughs> In Jesus' name, he's going to be conquered. And Lord, I thank you for that protection as we go. I thank you, Lord, for that bubble as we go. I thank you, Lord, that you're doing a new thing in high praise. You're doing a new thing in each person individually. You're doing a new thing in this region, in this state. And God, we are thrilled, excited, and thankful that you will use us to be part of it. In Jesus' name, amen.